CSS templates and like smush them together to do like exactly what I wanted. And it worked fine on my browser. It was perfect for like the things I had done. And then I loaded it on my phone and was like, ooh, because a bunch of things had broken. And so I had to like figure out how to like make that all work. Well, we're going to talk at 1.30, so what we could do, I'd show you like how Yeah, that'd be cool. And then do something. That'd be really cool. I would love that. We have a giant gong. 
Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So you can hear it on all three floors of the building. Okay. For better or for worse. <laughs> I mean, I assume our gong is also historic, but nobody seems to know where it came from at this point. <laughs> is it color? Oh, is it, is it a big metal thing? Yeah. yeah. It's like probably this big. All right, everybody, come on in. <laughs> Time for seminar. Well, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Sarah Horst, uh, who's going to speak to us um, about some of her research. Uh, Sarah's at Johns Hopkins, where she, she went in 2014. Before that, she had a, a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of uh, Colorado, working on oxygen-bearing molecules uh, and, and, and the formation and composition of planetary aerosols. Um, she did her PhD at the University of Arizona, uh, where she worked on post Cassini investigations of Titan's atmospheric chemistry. She also has a BS from uh, Caltech in planetary science and literature. And we had a long discussion about uh, how good it is to back up your original uh, undergraduate thesis on, on uh, more than just one hard drive, right? Uh, a good lesson for everybody. Uh, Today's our, the title of Sarah's talk is Planets in a Bottle, Exploring Planetary Atmospheres in the Lab. Sarah? There we go. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm tangled already. OK. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think I finally calmed down from the two and a half hours it took me to get from Baltimore this morning, <laughs> which I feel like everyone here can appreciate how much fun it is to drive around here. So I'm super excited to be here. Um, before I start saying science things, I just want to quickly um, acknowledge my research group um, at Hopkins. And in particular, I want to um, acknowledge my research scientist, Chow He, um, who did a lot of the experiments that I'm going to talk about today. And also just wanted to acknowledge um, the NASA Exoplanet Research Program that funded um, some of the experiments that I'm going to talk about today. Um, before I jump into you know, the details of what we've been doing, I want to kind of start with um, some of the big picture questions that we're interested in doing. And I will at some point explain um, the idea of planets in a bottle, but not quite yet. Um, so we're really interested in answering kind of two big, que big picture questions about how planetary atmospheres work. So one of the questions that has driven my research for the last, I guess, 15 years at this point is how far can organic chemistry proceed in an atmosphere in the absence of life? Um, and so one of the reasons that we're interested in answering that question is because we're really interested in understanding the role that atmospheres might play in the origin of life and the evolution of life. And so we need to know what kind of material can be produced in an atmosphere that could then potentially be useful for um, life. And the other question that we're interested in, which is related, is what role does haze play in the habitability of a world? And these two questions are related because haze particles may contain organic molecules that would be important for life. Um, but haze can also really affect the temperature structure of an atmosphere because particles interact differently with light than gases do. And so having a haze layer can really affect um, the temperature structure, whether or not you could potentially, ha potentially have um, liquid water stable on a surface. It will also affect what kinds of photons are getting to the surface of a planet, which could have implications on whether or not um, there could be life on that planet. And so these are kind of the big picture questions that we're interested in. If you're interested in studying organic chemistry in atmospheres um, and haze in atmospheres, um, the best place to try to understand those types of questions in the solar system is Titan. Um, this is Titan from Voyager, and I always like to joke that you too can um, reproduce the Voyager flyby in your own home with an iPhone and an orange. Um, you'll get approximately the same information, although you'll get a much higher resolution image. Um, but this is what we, uh, we learned from the Voyager flyby. Uh, luckily, Voyager was carrying other instruments, um, and in particular, Voyager was carrying an infrared spectrometer called IRIS. And from IRIS, we learned that Titan's atmosphere contains a lot of complex organic molecules. And so in particular, you can see um, there's things like acetylene. Um, there's propane if you want to barbecue this weekend. There's hydrogen cyanide if you don't like your friends and family very much. Um, and so we learned that there was this complex organic chemistry happening in Titan's atmosphere. 
Um, in particular, though, I think the, the Voyager flyby actually did us a little bit of a disservice in terms of the, the picture that emerged about how haze formation works, about what kinds of molecules um, are important for haze formation, about the types of organic chemistry that are happening in, in Titan's atmosphere. And the reason for that is if you look at the molecules that are labeled here, with the exception of hydrogen cyanide, these are all hydrocarbons. So they're only molecules that are made out of carbon and hydrogen. And so we left the Voyager era and kind of entered um, the era with Cassini and now this post-Cassini era. We had this idea that organic haze is produced from photochemistry that is operating on methane um, in mildly reduced atmospheres, so basically Titan. Um, and that this was the one true path for haze formation and that the only places that will be hazy are places that have methane photochemistry occurring in the atmosphere. Um, you will often hear Titan's haze referred to as Titan's hydrocarbon haze. Um, and I'm hoping that I can dissuade you of these two ideas um, going forward with what I want to talk to you about, what we've learned from the lab. So exiting the Voyager era, um, we didn't get a lot more Titan data for quite a number of years afterwards. And so one of the ways in which we started to study Titan's atmospheric chemistry was by moving into laboratory experiments. And these experiments operated mostly on um, nitrogen and methane. And so if you're familiar with the Miller-Urey experiments, it's a very similar idea. You take these two gases, you put energy into them, and see what kinds of chemistry occurs. And from these experiments, we learned two things that I think are really important. One thing that we learned is that nitrogen preferentially partitions into the solid phase. And so it turns out that one of the reasons that we actually weren't seeing that many nitrogen-bearing molecules in Titan's atmosphere from remote sensing is that when we do these lab experiments, we see the nitrogen really wants to be in the solid, not in the gas. Um, this is important because I just told you that people often refer to Titan's haze as a hydrocarbon haze. And we think now, based on lab experiments, there's actually a lot of nitrogen in those haze particles. Um, and I'll mention in a minute why that's really important. The other um, thing that we learned from lab experiments is that the presence of molecular nitrogen itself really dramatically increases particle production. And so if you were to just have methane in the atmosphere and you didn't have molecular nitrogen, the atmosphere wouldn't be nearly as hazy as it is once you have that nitrogen. So the nitrogen plays a really important role both in the formation of the particles in the first place and also in the composition of them. And so um, we know now that Titan should not uh, be considered to have a hydrocarbon haze because there should be a lot of nitrogen in the particles. So this is really important going back to that big picture question that I mentioned at the beginning because we had been excited about the possibilities for understanding prebiotic chemistry since Voyager, since we saw the methane and ethane and acetylene and propane and all of these things. But we know that all of life on Earth is based on a small set of molecules and that small set of molecules is based on a small set of atoms. The smallest that we tend to think of is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. So coming out of Voyager, we thought we had two. We thought we had the carbon and the hydrogen, and then we're wondering, you know, what else would have to happen to this prebiotic chemistry to, to pull in those two other elements? And then from these lab experiments and kind of going into Cassini, we realized, okay, no, we probably actually also have nitrogen. So that gives us three of those four um, small set of atoms that might be really important for understanding prebiotic chemistry. And then Cassini got to the Saturn system and we found out something else. So, maybe. Um, this is just a pretty picture because the thing I'm going to show you in a second isn't pretty, but that's, uh, that's Titan, that's Saturn. Um, and this is data from the Cassini plasma spectrometer, or CAPS. And so what you should be seeing here, um, although I realize the font is messed up now, is uh, that there are O plus ions flowing into the top of Titan's atmosphere. So from the plasma spectrometer, we found out that there is KeV oxygen, um, about 10 to the 6 per centimeter squared per second flowing into the top of Titan's atmosphere. Um, and so the first question I hope you're all asking yourselves if you don't already know the answer is where in the world is this oxygen coming from? Um, the answer, which is very surprising, is that it's coming from the plumes of Enceladus. And so this teeny, teeny, tiny moon in the Saturn system is shooting water out of its south pole. Some of that water gets ionized and hitches a ride on the magnetic field lines out to Titan where it's deposited in the top of the atmosphere. Um, we know what the plumes of Enceladus are made out of because after saying pretty please a whole bunch of times, the scientists finally con convinced the engineers to actually let Cassini fly through that. 
And so we have mass spectrometer measurements showing that the plumes are mostly water. I would love to tell you more about all of these other things, but that's a different talk. Um, that oxygen goes into Titan's atmosphere where we know it participates in the photochemistry because it turns out that the plumes of Enceladus are actually the source of the fourth most abundant molecule in Titan's atmosphere, which is carbon monoxide. And so we know that the oxygen is participating in the chemistry because we see it forming the CO and we know that it's going to participate further to form other molecules. And so now we know that we have all four of that small set of atoms actively participating in what we know is really rich organic chemistry in Titan's atmosphere. But there's one more thing that the Cassini plasma spectrometer taught us um, that is really important and relevant for this and I think makes Titan one of the most um, compelling targets for exploration. Uh, and apparently I'm not the only one since we just managed to convince NASA to send another mission there. Um, so prior to the arrival of Cassini, the heaviest molecule that had been detected in Titan's atmosphere was benzene just C6H6, it has a mass of 78. And so our idea was basically if you were going to fly a mass spectrometer through the top of Titan's atmosphere, which we did with Cassini, you would probably have signal up to a mass of maybe 100, so five or six heavy atoms. Um, and in fact, that was the mass cutoff of the mass spectrometer that was specifically designed to study Titan's atmosphere. So you might think that the data would look something like this. This is mass to charge on the x-axis and number on the y-axis. Um, it turns out that that is not actually what the top of Titan's atmosphere looks like. And luckily, the Cassini plasma spectrometer didn't have such a cutoff. And so instead, when Cassini started flying through the top of Titan's atmosphere, the CAPS data looked like this. Um, there's a couple of things to notice first. This is a log scale, um, which is a really awesome way to stress out people who, usually, who are used to looking at mass spec, because you basically never plot your data on a log scale. So the Cassini plasma spectrometer discovered that there are ions very high in Titan's atmosphere. We're at 950 kilometers above the surface at this point that have a mass to charge up to 10,000 AMU. Now something that large is almost certainly carrying one, more than one charge. And so we're talking about ions that have a mass of maybe 20 or 30 or 40,000 AMU. Um, just to give you a sense of scale for those of you who maybe don't think about these things as much, that's our friend benzene, six carbon atoms, mass of 78. I sat in ChemDraw one day and drew a not-for-real molecule, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, that weighs 10,000 AMU. So now we're talking about something that has six or 700 heavy atoms rather than six or seven heavy atoms. And so that's kind of the scale of how wrong we were about the complexity of the chemistry that's occurring in Titan's atmosphere. I think it's an understatement to say that this has really dramatically changed our understanding of aerosol formation. But the other thing that's really interesting about this is that these ions are located in the exact same region of Titan's atmosphere where that KeV oxygen is being deposited. And so this place where we see this formation of these very large ions is also a place where we know there's active chemistry occurring involving carbon hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Unfortunately, with this instrument, we weren't able to identify any of these ions, and so we know that they exist, and we have no idea what they are. And that'll require another mission. So we came out of this, this you know, part of the Cassini area thinking, wow, Titan's atmosphere is really interesting. Its upper atmosphere is doing all this really interesting chemistry. Maybe Titan is really unique in the solar system. Um, but it turns out that Titan's not an exception um, and I'm starting to wonder if it might not be the rule in terms of the complexity that can occur in the tops of, of planetary atmospheres. So this is Saturn now, um, kind of similar to the data that I showed you uh, with Iris, except for this is the um, Cassini infrared spectrometer. So again, we're looking in the infrared. Um, you see some of the same molecules that I mentioned for Titan. There's benzene, there's acetylene. If you really hate your friends and family, Saturn has phosphine. Um, but again, you know, a couple of heavy atoms that we're seeing in the infrared spectrum. At the very end of Cassini's mission, uh, Cassini was intentionally crashed into Saturn and took mass spectrometer measurements um, basically as long as it could before we lost signal. Uh, and this is what they look like. So the thing to understand about Saturn is that its atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium. And atmospheric models predicted that the only two molecules that Cassini should have measured from the mass spectrometer were hydrogen and helium, which are down here. None of the rest of this is supposed to be here. None of the rest of it was predicted to exist. 
um, prior to the data coming back. And so now we know that Saturn's ionosphere has incredibly complex chemistry happening as well. Um, this is benzene over here. There's some evidence that there might be toluene as well. Um, unfortunately, the plasma spectrometer that gave us those beautiful data uh, from Titan was actually the only instrument that wasn't operational at the end of Cassini's mission. And so we never got CAPS measurements um, of Saturn's atmosphere in the way that we got um, the measurements of Titan's atmosphere. But we now know that Saturn's atmosphere is also um, quite complex and, and producing a lot of these organic molecules that we think are important um, for the origin of life. Not that I think there's life on Saturn, but it's just to say that this seems to be a thing that atmospheres like to do. Um, so we kind of came out of this, the Cassini era with a bunch more questions. Um, and especially trying to understand what those big ions were that were seen um, in the CAPS data. And so one of the things that we wanted to try to do was to understand what those ions could be and how they might form. I actually started out my career as a photochemical modeler, not as an experimentalist, but it turns out that photochemical models are actually not very good at doing chemistry that's more complex than like five or six heavy atoms. So we're really, really good up to benzene for Titan's atmosphere, and then everything kind of falls apart for various reasons. So we couldn't figure out what the ions were from the data. We couldn't figure out what the ions were from um, models. And so that kind of left experimental work as our, our last remaining tool in our toolbox to try to understand these questions. So all of the experiments I'm going to talk about today operate under the same principle. We take the simple abundant atmospheric gases. So for Titan, it would probably be methane, nitrogen, and maybe carbon monoxide. We expose them to some type of energy source. Um, in the case of my uh, research, I've used two different energy sources, a plasma um, or UV photon sources, which I'll mention a little bit more when we get there. Um, and then you will often, depending on the conditions, make some type of complex organic solid, which then we can look at um, for whatever, uh, whatever purposes we're interested in, depending on the question we're asking. Um, in a little bit more detail, this is a, a little schematic of the chamber that we've built at Johns Hopkins. We call it the Planetary Haze Research Chamber, or PHASER. Um, we designed this chamber to be able to access all of the atmospheres in the solar system and a good chunk of the atmospheres that we think are interesting for extrasolar planets. Um, so we can run experiments from 90 to 800 Kelvin. We have two different energy, energy sources, a cold plasma energy source or a Lyman alpha photon source. Um, and just to give you a sense of scale and what it actually looks like in real life, um, this is an excited exoplanet astronomer um, for scale. That's Caroline Morley, for those of you who might know her. And um, that's the experiment when it's running. It's about the size of a two liter bottle, and so this is where the idea of planets in a bottle came from. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a couple of questions that we have been um, asking to try to understand um, the broader ranges of haze formation that are possible. Now that we know that this idea that um, you know, methane haze formation is, is not the one, the one true path, we want to figure out what are the other paths. Uh, and so we put together a couple of questions to try to investigate that, particularly looking at the effect of oxygen-bearing compounds. Um, my apologies for the fact that my slides have decided to be modern art. Um, so one of the first questions that we asked was, what is the effect of carbon monoxide on haze formation and also its composition? And the reason for that is this discovery of these oxygen ions flowing into the top of Titan's atmosphere. We wanted to investigate the role that CO might play. It also turns out that Titan isn't the only hazy nitrogen methane CO atmosphere in our solar system. Um, this is to scale, and so it's cheating a little bit, but these two images were taken at almost the exact same phase angle. That's Titan, that's Pluto, which is also hazy. Um, and I feel like contractually obligated to show this picture every time I give a talk because I feel like everyone in the world needs to have seen this picture, but this is Pluto. Um, you can see that it's quite hazy, uh, in fact, very reminiscent of Titan. And so this question about carbon monoxide isn't just relevant for Titan, but it's also relevant for trying to understand the chemistry happening in Pluto's atmosphere. So the first thing we just wanted to look at was the effect on, of production rate. And so we started by looking at a whole bunch of different carbon monoxide concentrations. So on the x-axis, we have percent carbon monoxide in the initial gas mixture. And on the y-axis is aerosol mass loading. You can just think of it as the amount of stuff that was being produced in the experiment. This is using 0.1% methane with a UV source. And you can see as we put more CO into the experiment, we produce more particles. This was also true when we did 2% methane with a UV source. Then we switched to uh, energetic um, plasma that came from a spark discharge um, with the two different methane concentrations, and we saw the exact same trend. And so in all cases, as we put more CO into the gas mixture, um, we saw a higher production rate. People always ask me why I stopped. 
because um, it would be interesting to see if this trend plateaus or it turns over or what happens. Um, it was just a, a, by virtue of the way the experiment was set up that we weren't able to put more CO into the setup um, than 5%, but maybe someday I'll get around to, to looking at this some more. Um, we were actually able to look at another question because we wanted to know why this was happening. Does CO make particle nucleation, that first step in forming a particle, more efficient? Or does it make the growth more efficient? Because those are two separate processes. And the way we were doing these measurements, we were actually able to look at that because what we were measuring was the, the particle size distribution. So this is the example of the actual measurements. And so this is the particle size distribution. Uh, with 2% methane, we have particles that are, that are um, about 20 nanometers in diameter. Um, if you add 5% CO to the gas mixture, this is what the particle size distribution looks like instead. Um, and so not only do you have more particles, but we also have particles now that are more like 150 nanometers in diameter. And so we were able to look at both the, the particle size and the particle number density. And what we see, again, CO on the x-axis, and now we're looking at diameter on the y-axis, is that as we put more CO into the gas mixture, the particles are bigger. And so that means that the presence of CO is making growth more efficient. Um, we also looked at the number density of particles and saw the same trend. So as we put more CO into the gas mixture, the number of particles is also increasing. So this means that adding CO to the gas mixtures makes both nucleation and growth more efficient. Um, and that means that the presence of CO could be really important for understanding atmospheric chemistry. One thing I forgot to mention, the lowest numbers on here is actually just 50 parts per million, which is the amount of CO in Titan's atmosphere. And so for some of these experiments, even having that small amount of CO really mattered. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Decreases? That's a, that's a very... Uh, that is a very wise question. Um, I'll show some more of that data if I have, if I have enough time to talk about the early Earth experiments. Um, most, if not all, of the experiments that use methane around the world, there's maybe like six groups that do this type of work, um, have shown that there's a peak in the methane concentration um, where you get peak production. Um, for the UV, the peak tends to be uh, pushed very, very, um, to relatively low methane concentrations, you start to end up with a, an optical depth effect um, where you're basically running out of photons to actually build the larger molecules because the methane is taking all of them. Um, so that's what happens. Uh, with the plasmas, it, the peak tends to be at ha higher methane concentrations. Um, and actually, this is relevant to the next slide that I was going to say. Um, so one of the reasons we think that um, for plasmas, you still have this um, cutoff that starts to happen is that we know from other types of experiments that the more molecular hydrogen there is in the experiment, the more molecular hydrogen there is in the atmosphere, um, the fewer particles you produce. So it terminates, um, terminates the growth of chains. And so one of the things that we have shown um, by looking at the gas phase composition in these experiments is that the addition of CO actually decreases the hydrogen abundance in the chamber. So this is mass spec data, um, CO percent again on the uh, x-axis. You don't need to care about the rest of these except for the two AMU, which is molecular hydrogen. So you can see in the gas phase as we put more CO into the chamber, um, we get less and less hydrogen being produced. And so the CO chemistry is helping remove some of the hydrogen from the system. And so we think that's one of the reasons why um, CO has this effect in these experiments because it's actually helping um, reduce the amount of, of hydrogen in, in the gas phase. One of the other things that we learned from doing this, um, so people, when I first started showing this work, would say to me, well, Sarah, you put more carbon in the system, of course you're making more particles because carbon likes to build these nice long chains and this isn't that interesting, um, go away. <laughs> people actually really said that to me. Um, but it is interesting and it's not just the carbon. Um, so we did elemental analysis on the particles, and one of the things that we find is that the more CO you put into the experiment, the more oxygen you get in the particles. And so the oxygen is actually actively participating in the chemistry. It's partitioning into the solid phase. Um, it's interesting because it actually seems at some point to be mostly at the expense of nitrogen, and so those two things seem to have a limit on the total amount of both of them that can be in, in a particle. Um, although we've done some recent work that might actually um, say that that's not true. One of the other things that we wanted to do was look to see what kinds of molecules we were actually making. So we did high resolution mass spectrometry on some of the CO experiments. And what we found is that if we give these experiments all four of those atoms that are interesting to us, we produce a lot of molecules of biological interest. And so we see that we can produce um, the, both purine bases, adenine and guanine, and both uh, all three pyrimidine bases, thymine, uracil, and cytosine, that life on Earth use. So that's our familiar ATCG. 
Um, we also saw that we could produce the two smallest biological amino acids, glycine and alanine. Um, we actually looked for all of the biological or proteinogenic amino acids that use um, C, N, H, and O. Um, we found the molecular formulas of almost all of them, um, but were unable to determine structure, probably because the samples are so complicated and the, the relative concentrations are pretty low. Um, it was only these four at the bottom, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, tyrosine, and tryptophan, that we didn't see any evidence of in the samples that we made. Um, one of the more recent things that we did looking at these types of molecules um, showed that upper atmospheres might actually be a really, really great place to produce prebiotic molecules. And so what you're seeing here is, are the results of two different experiments that used methane, CO, and nitrogen. And in this column, which is full of all kinds of things, um, was a plasma experiment. And in this column, which doesn't have nearly as many things, was an experiment that was driven by a UV source. And so what you're seeing here is that with the plasma, we're making all of these things I just mentioned, all of these nucleobases, all of these amino acids, um, some other molecules that, that are uh, considered to be prebiotically interesting, like guanidine and urea. Um, but when you do the photochemistry experiments, we don't see these. And so it seems like, at least in atmospheric conditions, if you want to produce these types of molecules, you need a lot more energy in the system. And the place where you find that is in an atmosphere is in the upper atmosphere. And so we think this is really interesting. I'm pretty convinced once we get a chance to actually measure the gas phase composition of Titan's ionosphere, we'll see that there are amino acids and nucleobase, nucleobases being produced in the top of Titan's atmosphere. And that has really important implications um, for what was going on on the early Earth as well. So just to give a quick summary of, of that section, we looked at what the effect of carbon monoxide was on haze formation and composition. We found that the particle size, number density, and the total mass loading all increase as a function of increasing CO. We found that the presence of CO decreases the gas phase hydrogen. It actually didn't show this data, but we did NMR um, on these samples and showed that the hydrogen is actually moving from saturated to unsaturated structures. Um, and so it's not just in the gas phase that the hydrogen chemistry is changing. Um, we see that the aerosol becomes more oxygen rich um, as the abundance of CO increases. And we also see the production of molecules of prebiotic interest. Um, and so that was kind of our, our first foray into starting to study the oxygen containing molecules, but I wanted to do more of them. Um, and unfortunately, to do more of them, you have to actually journey outside of the solar system because we don't have a particularly diverse collection of planetary atmospheres in the solar system. So we got interested in studying exoplanets. But there are a lot of exoplanets um, that cover a wide range of atmospheric phase space, and we weren't really sure where to start. So we decided that the question that we first wanted to, to look at was to think about which super-Earth and mini-Neptune atmospheres will be hazy, and what will that haze be like? And so a re the reason for this um, was the following. We know that a large fraction of the observable atmospheres will be super-Earths and mini-Neptunes. The reason that we know that is because super-Earths and mini-Neptunes are the most abundant type of planet in the galaxy, uh, which is unfortunate because we don't appear to have one in our solar system. Um, we're going to have a lot of them to be able to observe. Just to give you a quick demonstration of that, this is the predicted test yield. Um, you see that most of the planets that TESS will find that we'll be able to observe um, are, are mini-Neptunes or super-Earths. The other reason we were interested in this phase space is that for the kind of handful of super-Earths and mini-Neptunes that have um, pretty good atmospheric observations already, um, they're all coming up with what are being referred to as flat spectra. Um, so this is GJ1214b, which is a known problem child in the exoplanet community because its spectrum uh, in the wavelengths that it's been measured is actually consistent with a straight line, um, which is not usually how planetary atmospheres work. But this indicates that there is probably an aerosol absorber of some type, whether it's clouds or photochemical hazes or both in its atmosphere. And so we already know that some of these atmospheres are hazy, and so we wanted to investigate how that might happen. So we built a matrix of, of, uh, that spanned pretty large composition space because we don't actually have any good measurements yet so we could sim simulate a real planet. And so instead we wanted to just investigate the space space. So we went from 300 to 600 Kelvin and we went from 100 times to uh, 10,000 times solar metallicity. For those of you who don't think about metallicity, you can think about these atmospheres as being hydrogen, water, or CO2 rich atmospheres being the dominant gas. So we did um, all of these gas mixtures, um, both for plasma source and a UV source. And the first thing that we looked at was the haze production rate. And so we found that there was a wide range of haze production rates um, spanning about four orders of magnitude. 
Um, this is not particularly surprising, but it goes to show at least that there will be planets, um, super Earths and mini Neptunes that will have nice clear atmospheres that will be easy to observe their spectral lines and figure out what they're made out of. One thing that was really surprising to us though, this gray line is our kind of standard Titan experiment. Um, and we had two cases, the 300 and 400 Kelvin water rich atmospheres that actually produced more particles than our standard Titan experiment. And so if you can envision a planet that is more hazy than Titan, which is a very perplexing statement, uh, apparently there are some that can exist. And so we're still working on trying to understand um, what the chemical processes are that result in the haze formation being so efficient in these gas mixtures. Um, we did the same thing with UV and we saw some similar trends, again, a wide range of production rates. And once again, this 300 Kelvin, thousand times solar metallicity experiment, this one that was water rich, had the highest production rate. Another thing that we've been looking at um, is trying to understand how the optical properties will change for all of these different gas mixtures. And we're, we're going to be measuring optical constants. We're working on it right now, but we already know that it's going to be interesting because you can actually just look at the particles and see that they're different colors. Um, these two experiments that had very Titan-like production rates also look suspiciously Titan color, which is really interesting. Although I can tell you that we have done mass spec on all three of these samples and they are extremely different. Um, and so even though they have very similar production rates and look very similar in visible light, the composition is completely different. And so there's different pathways um, to be able to form these particles. Um, we also made particle colors that we'd never seen in the lab before. This one we decided is olive green. This one's chocolate brown. Um, I sometimes worry that means I haven't been feeding my research group enough because they came up with food names for those, but here we are. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to, to actually measure the optical constants for these particles and see um, how they're gonna be interacting with light. The other thing that we did was we were monitoring the gas phase composition during all of these experiments. And this is a, a very busy um, plot because it's one of these like abstract figures, um, but I'll walk you through it. So this is the summary of all of the gas phase measurements we did for all 18 of those experiments. Um, and so this is metallicity, this is the temperature of the gas. Um, everywhere where there's an X, it means that we produced organic molecules from the chemistry. Um, I will spoil alert that all of these <laughs> produced um, organic molecules. One of the things that's most interesting is this gas mixture right here, that 600 Kelvin, 10,000 times solar metallicity experiment has no methane in it. And so we produced organic molecules from an initial gas mixture that had no methane in it. It had carbon in it, but it didn't have methane, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the models are equilibrium models that were done by Julie Moses. And so basically what we, so the initial matrix that we set up was simply temperature and solar metallicity. And then she ran an equilibrium model for our starting gas mixtures. So um, it's in equilibrium at the pressure, which I always forget to say, we run at one millibar. Um, and so the gases and temperature and pressure are self-consistent in equilibrium with each other at one millibar, which is the region of the atmosphere where we think haze formation starts um, in most atmospheres. Um, we would love to actually have real atmospheres to work with, but we don't have um, good data yet. Um, but the main reason that we use metallicity as our proxy is because that's the way astronomers, that's one of the ways that astronomers think about exoplanets right now. Um, I don't like thinking about them that way, but that was what we did. It also gave us a nice region of phase space in terms of, um, in terms of uh, you know, redox state, basically. I don't know if that answers your question or not. We can talk about it more if it doesn't. Um, so we saw organic molecules in all of the experiments. Um, the stars um, are the abiotic production of molecular oxygen, um, which we see in a lot of the experiments, particularly um, the 10,000 times solar experiment. Um, this is really interesting because we're seeing the production of molecular oxygen in the presence of organic molecules, which is something that people often suggest as being um, a potential biosignature. So this is just kind of a cautionary tale that there are plenty of ways to make molecular oxygen in the presence of, um, in the presence of organic molecules. And I'm like 99.999% sure we haven't created life in the lab. 
Um, I would gladly accept our Nobel Prize if we did. And so um, we just have to be careful about that. And then these triangles are the presence of what we um, label prebiotic precursors. So these are molecules that people often talk about um, as being important for prebiotic chemistry. So they're things like um, formaldehyde, acetonitrile. Um, we see the formation of those in most of the experiments. And in fact, the only ones that we don't see them in are these very reducing gas mixtures that were dominated by molecular hydrogen. Um, so just to give a quick summary, we looked at a bunch of different super Earths and mini Neptunes. Um, we figured out that the water dominated cases produce substantial amounts of particles. Um, we know that these particles all are going to have different optical properties because we can see that they're different colors when we look at them with our eyes. Um, Metallicity and temperature both appear to matter, although the way in which we built that matrix, which I just described, makes it hard to actually investigate those two things independently. Um, that's something that we're working on more now. And we see the production of organics and O2 um, simultaneously in the gas phase. Um, I want to show you um, a little bit more work that we did on exoplanets with the following request. Um, please no pictures or tweets, and especially no tweets with pictures. Um, so we have actually done 800 Kelvin experiments as well. Um, and the thing that's really interesting about the 800 Kelvin um, phase space is that in the 10,000 times case, we end up with a new atom that we haven't had in any of our experiments before, which is sulfur. Um, and it's in the form of hydrogen sulfide. And so we wanted to see what the effect of hydrogen sulfide was on the experiments. Um, these are SEM images of disks that were, or sorry, AFM images of disks that were um, collected uh, from the bottom of the chamber. Um, the top ones are with hydrogen sulfide for the plasma and the UV. The bottom ones are without hydrogen sulfide. I should mention that nothing else changes about the gas mixture. So when we remove the hydrogen sulfide, we replace it with argon um, so that it's something that's inert. Um, so you can see that there's a pretty dramatic change um, between the hydrogen, sulfi uh, hydrogen sulfide cases and no hydrogen sulfide cases. Um, we actually looked at the particle production rate. Um, this is with hydrogen sulfide for both the plasma and the UV. This is without hydrogen sulfide for the plasma and the UV. Um, and so we see about a factor of three to four change in the production rate with the addition of hydrogen sulfide. Um, just to add to the plot that we had before, so this is the one I showed you with the plasma experiments. Um, and now adding that 800 Kelvin um, point on here um, is really interesting because uh, what we actually see in the 1,000 times case is that as we're increasing the temperature, the production rate goes down, but the opposite thing seems to be happening um, at 800 or at uh, 10,000 times solar metallicity. And so there's a lot of trends here that need to be investigated. Um, the other thing that's really interesting, we looked at the gas phase. And one of the things is that the total amount of gas phase products doesn't actually seem to be affected that much by the presence of hydrogen sulfide. But the composition of them really changes. Um, in particular, the amount of molecular oxygen that's being produced really decreases. And we start to see um, the formation of a bunch of sulfur-containing molecules that might be interesting in terms of prebiotic chemistry. So we see the formation of a fair number of organic sulfur compounds, um, which is something that we're looking forward to investigating further. Um, so the presence of hydrogen sulfide increases the production rate. Um, we see that the production of gas phase organics is relatively unaffected, but that the O2 production decreases. Um, and we see the, the um, production seem to increase as a function of increasing temperature at the 10,000 times metallicity experiments, which is interesting because that's actually the opposite of what a lot of photochemistry models have uh, predicted. Um, and so that's something that we need to investigate more. Um, and I just want to quickly, because I've already talked to a couple of people about it this morning, um, talk about our, our final favorite uh, oxygen-containing molecule. So I started out with carbon monoxide. Um, the exoplanet experiments have carbon dioxide and water and CO, um, depending on where you are in the matrix. And so we looked at those three oxygen-containing molecules. Um, but I wanted to go all the way to the other end of the oxidation state and go to molecular oxygen and see the effect that molecular oxygen has. Um, this is particularly interesting because a lot of people have hypothesized that the early Earth had a haze layer. Um, and people tend to, th to think about that as, you know, the second there was a whiff of oxygen in the atmosphere, it was like a light switch flipped and the haze layer disappeared. And we wanted to investigate whether or not that was true. Um, and so again, just going back to this idea that oxidized atmospheres are less favorable for photochemical haze formation, I hope I've already dissuaded you a little bit of that by looking at those exoplanets. Um, but not all oxygen-bearing molecules are the same, and so we wanted to look at the effect of O2. So I'm going to walk you through a series of experiments that were kind of complicated, and so we're going to do it stepwise by adding one gas at a time. 
So first, we're just going to be looking at methane and nitrogen containing um, gas mixtures. Um, and so you can see we did a wide range of methane concentrations, and you see a range of production rates. We're in total volume now, which is just, again, a measure of how much stuff there is. Um, to give you a sense, and this was a trend that I referred to um, earlier when asked about the methane concentration, in this particular experiment, the aerosol production actually peaks at about 100 parts per million methane, which um, we'd shown from previous work. And so all of these points are actually um, right around, uh, except for the 19 part per million, right around the peak aerosol production in terms of the amount of methane in the experiment. Um, after we did the methane and nitrogen only experiments, we started adding CO2. Um, we used two different CO2 concentrations, 260 parts per million and 394 parts per million. Um, we see what had been demonstrated in a lot of previous experiments, including things like Miller-Urey. The more CO2 you put into an experiment, the fewer particles you get, um, which is the opposite of the trend that we were seeing with CO. So again, not all oxygen-bearing molecules are the same. But we were happy because this was consistent with what had been previously seen. Um, and then we started adding molecular oxygen to the gas mixture. So this is going to flatten back out. Um, so here's our methane-only experiments, or methane-nitrogen experiments. These are the methane-nitrogen-CO2 um, experiments. And then we added um, a wide range of oxygen concentrations. So one of the first things that I want you to notice about this um, is as we put small amounts of molecular oxygen into the gas phase, um, all of the production rates increased for all of the different experiments we were looking at. So a little bit of molecular oxygen actually makes haze formation more efficient, which is interesting. Um, and then as we put more and more into the experiment, um, it decreased exactly the way everybody kind of thought that it would, um, that having that O2 would really dramatically decrease the haze production rate. Um, to give you a sense of what these numbers mean, um, this is our standard Titan experiment in this particular setup. Um, and so actually a lot of these, ex these uh, experiments had more particles than Titan. Um, this is what the air looked like in the lab one day. Um, so you can see that it's not particularly hazy. Uh, but if you actually measure it, there are some particles. Um, but then you might say to me, well, Sarah, these production rates are super low. Um, and while that's definitely true, we were absolutely generating particles because this is what the exact same experiment looked like when we ran the gas mixture all the way through every piece of tubing, everything else, and into the instrument without turning the energy on. Um, and so in every single one of these experiments, even with those very large amounts of oxygen, we were producing particles from these gas mixtures. Now, one thing I want to emphasize about this is that in all of these experiments, there's more CO2 than methane. So we've already pushed ourselves into the regime where particle production isn't as efficient. And in a number of these experiments, there is more molecular oxygen than methane. And we're still generating particles. Um, so that was really interesting. But then things got more interesting. We found that as we add O2, we end up uh, creating really efficient nitrogen fixation. And so these are two different experiments. This is the 158 parts per million methane, 394 parts per million CO2. The green um, is mass spec of the particles with no molecular oxygen. And the blue is mass spec of the particles with 20 parts per million molecular oxygen. You see the shift in the types of compounds that we're making um, really strongly towards the, for the formation of nitrate. Um, which was really surprising to us, um, but has now been reproduced and also seen in the gas phase. So that was really interesting. Um, and then the other thing that we found, um, and if you like optical constants, feel free to look at this table. And if you don't, I'll tell you what it all means. Um, but when we looked at the optical properties of the particles, what we found was, um, you know, I showed you the kind of Titan-like particles, the really famous like orangey brown stuff that likes to really strongly absorb light. Um, we can transform those orangey-brown, very absorbing particles into things that are like teeny tiny mirrors that reflect every photon that interacts with them by putting small amounts of oxygen in the gas phase. And so the, the addition of oxygen basically results in particles that don't um, absorb photons at all. And so this would really dramatically affect um, the way that they're interacting with light and what effect that would have on the temperature structure um, as the composition of the haze layer was changing. Um, and so, just to summarize quickly the oxygen story, with relatively small amounts of methane, we produced aerosol in the lab with up to 200 parts per million oxygen present in the gas phase. So that's more oxygen than methane, which is very perplexing. Um, as the O2 concentration increased, the aerosol became increasingly oxygen and nitrogen rich. So we saw this increase in the efficiency of nitrogen fixation. 
Um, the addition of oxygen results, oh, I just said that. <laughs> the addition of oxygen also results in particles that are non-absorbing. Um, and I realized there was one thing I forgot to mention. Um, those gas mixtures may have seemed oddly specific, like 394 parts per million uh, CO2. Um, in this particular case, the gas mixture combinations um, were the outputs of a model looking at what the mantle composition would be. And so the assumption here is a lot of our trace gases are being outgassed either um, from the seafloor or from volcanoes. Um, during that period of Earth's history. And so that was what we wanted to um, investigate in terms of our, our sources there. Um, so just to quickly summarize everything I've told you uh, into hopefully one coherent story. We started out with this idea from the Voyager encounter and from the science done around the Voyager encounter that organic haze is produced from methane photochemistry in mildly reducing atmospheres, that this was the one true path. These were the only places that would be hazy. Um, this meant, for example, we weren't going to have to worry a lot about a lot of exoplanets because most planets won't be hazy. Most planets aren't like this. Um, I think what we now know um, from the years of experiments that my group has been doing and from work that a lot of other groups have been doing, that there are actually very many paths to the generation of photochemical hazes. Um, there appear to be paths that actually don't require the presence of methane at all, um, which is fascinating. We know that oxygen-bearing molecules um, each play a really unique role in haze formation. Some of them increase haze formation. Some of them decrease haze formation. Um, in all cases, they really dramatically affect the composition of the particles, which then can affect the way that they interact with light um, and will also uh, affect how useful they might be in terms of prebiotic chemistry. Um, we, know, we know now that oxidized atmospheres may also actually be favorable for haze formation. There will be different kinds of particles, um, but particles nonetheless. Um, and then kind of thinking back to the, the Earth example, um, one of the things I think as planetary scientists we try to avoid thinking about is that planets aren't static um, and that even if we figure them out in like one moment in one period of time, they're doing all kinds of other things both before and after that. Um, and so as a planet's atmosphere evolves, which, which atmospheres all do through escape processes, uh, for example, its haze will evolve too. Um, and so planets may have a haze layer at some point in their history or many points in their history. The composition may be different depending on when that is. Um, and so finally, I think the, the summary of that is um, that there's still a lot of work to do. I like to consider that job security, but sometimes it feels a little bit overwhelming. Um, and so just to, to quickly say one more thing about what the next steps are um, in terms of answering the questions that we have um, about Titan, I uh, have had this slide um, in talks for three years now. <laughs> and every time I would like cross my fingers and do this little like, you know, hopefully this will actually happen dance, uh, now it's actually happening. Um, so the next step for trying to understand um, how far prebiotic chemistry has progressed on Titan uh, is Dragonfly, which I hope everybody has heard about already. But it's a rotorcraft lander. Uh, so it's a dual quadcopter. Um, we will go to Titan. Um, with a very capable mass spectrometer with two drills, um, we will sample the surface, uh, ingest it into our mass spectrometer, and hopefully figure out what all of these complex organics are on the surface, try to understand what that means for how far um, organic chemistry can proceed, presumably in the absence of life, um, all the while also paying very, very close attention for any potential signs of life that we might see while we're investigating the surface. Um, and hopefully I can, I seem to have lost the ability to see this on the computer, which is causing me problems, but I think I can see it over here. Um, just to show you a quick animation um, of how it works. Uh, so we will have um, two hours of extreme stress followed by a few minutes of really extreme stress because we fly off of parachute. Um, so the good news is once we land on Titan, we will already know that we can fly. Um, the bad news is if we can't fly, we'll be crashing on Titan instead. <laughs> Um, but we'll fly to our initial landing site. Um, the two drills are right here. I don't know if you can see them. There's one on each skid. This is our high gain antenna, so we talk directly to Earth. The high gain antenna has cameras mounted on it, and so we'll be able to get panoramas of the surface. There's other cameras that help us fly. Uh, we're powered by an RTG, which is shown right there. Um, and so basically the idea is we'll land um, we'll sample, we'll do science. Um, in addition to the mass spectrometer, we have a gamma ray neutron spectrometer, which will give us some information um, kind of about the bulk composition any place we land, 
um, and will also give us information about composition deeper than we'll be able to sample with the drill, which will only probably go to about 10 centimeters. Um, we also have a really uh, robust meteorological package, and so we'll be looking at winds, um, temperatures, we'll be looking at methane relative humidity. Uh, we have a seismometer, so if there's any Titan quakes, we will find out. Um, and then we have all of our cameras, which um, are important for flying, but we'll also be able to do scientific investigations. Um, and so then we'll be able to take off and fly somewhere else. This is really going to let us uh, investigate the diversity of, of the surface features that we see on Titan. Um, but a lot of that diversity is also chemical diversity. And so um, hopefully in our two and a half year nominal mission, um, we'll, we'll be able to finally answer some of the questions that I have about the chemistry in Titan's atmosphere. Um, but if not, hopefully we can go on an extended mission and, and sort those questions out at some point. Um, and with that, I would love to take questions. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Great talk. Um, <clears throat> For the for Titan for the okay going back to your carbon monoxide yes. uh, experiments so you showed that you that carbon monoxide plays a huge role in making these heavier aerosol things yeah but you all, I think you also said that the oxygen for that is coming as high energy oxygen ions from Enceladus Enceladus yeah so how does that become carbon monoxide to participate in the chemistry yeah that's a really good question <laughs> um, it's through processes involving methane photochemistry and so basically the oxygen ions come in. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're relatively energetic, they're KEV, and so it takes them a little while to stop. In the process of stopping, they lose their charge. Um, and so they end up basically as, um, as O3P, which is super reactive. Uh, and so it ends up reacting with some of the products of methane photochemistry, eventually making CO. CO is super stable. It's, the, it's basically the most stable molecule in Titan's atmosphere besides nitrogen, right? They're isoelectronic, so they're both very stable. Um, so... The CO can build up in Titan's atmosphere over time, um, depending on what Enceladus is doing. And so actually the chemistry is really interesting to me, and we haven't had time to investigate this further, but I think the CO actually acts as a clock um, on what Enceladus has been doing and also um, on the age of Titan's atmosphere, which is one of our outstanding questions. Um, one of the things that's really cool that we need to think more about now is we have actually really great um, oxygen isotope measurements for the CO in Titan's atmosphere from Alma. Um, and so we actually have the first detection of 17 oxygen in the outer solar system from ALMA in the CO in Titan's atmosphere. So we have all the oxygen isotopes um, for Titan's atmosphere, and we have some isotope measurements from the mass spec um, data from Enceladus. And so I really want to um, spend some time actually thinking about the modeling of, that, of the chemical processes that you're asking about, um, not because of the more complex chemistry, but because of a bunch of other questions that we have about the origin and evolution of Titan's atmosphere. You know, nobody has ever asked me that question. I'm going to have to sit down and think about it. Um, but that's a, that's a great question actually related to a conversation that I was having this morning um, about trying to think about how, um, you know, we say, okay, well, solar metallicity, and then, you know, if the solar system was an exoplanet system, we would then assume that all of the planets in that system were, you know, solar metallicity atmospheres, which is obviously not true. Um, and also, you know, going back to this issue of the fact that atmospheres evolve over time. So I don't actually know the answer, um, but I think that's a really uh, great question. I'll actually go back and calculate it so that I can, can think about that in terms of our exoplanet uh, phase space. Because those, and I didn't mention, but the, um, those, the Earth experiments were done at 300 Kelvin. Um, so it actually would be really interesting to see where that fits uh, in terms of our, our phase space. Um, unfortunately, they were completely different experimental setups because um, the early Earth work was done when I was a postdoc. The exoplanet stuff is in my, in my group at Hopkins, but um, we want to get back to doing the early Earth work, so we'll probably do some oxygen stuff soon. To think about? Yeah. 
So actually, this whole story that I just told you, the whole last like 11 years of my career, all started with the following. We were trying to figure out if there was enough energy in the oxygen ions flowing into the top of Titan's atmosphere for the energy to be important for the energy balance of Titan's atmosphere. Um, and so I've actually thought about this issue of you know there being this extra energy source of these things coming in. We're actually super, super interested in the role that um, interplanetary dust plays in haze formation um, and have spent an egregious amount of time trying to figure out how to design an experiment um, to actually study that. We know that micrometeorites play an important role um, in atmospheric chemistry because we see evidence of the ionization in Earth's atmosphere and Venus's atmosphere. Um, there's a bunch of really interesting stuff happening right now um, with the Martian atmosphere, with MAVEN, um, looking at the interaction of, of external sources of dust. And so I think you're absolutely right. I think that it's a, it's a source um, that I think is going to be really important, especially for nucleation that has just been utterly neglected. Um, of course, for the exoplanet work, it's going to be really hard to think about. At least in the solar system, we have some sense of what those fluxes are like and what those particles are made out of. Um, but I think actually, and I, I, th I already said this to at least one person this morning, um, with exoplanets, I think our, our biggest challenges are going to be um, not knowing our boundary conditions, not knowing what's coming up from the, from the surface in terms of you know, outgassing or oceans, but then also not knowing if you know, GJ1214b has an Enceladus that's shooting water at it, um, or what the dust flux might be, or things like that, which can really hugely affect the chemistry, and we don't have any way to measure at least any time in the near future. <laughs> Um, is there any way to build substrates into your experiments? You have a lot of interesting gas phase interactions going on, but what about mineral surfaces or liquid surfaces? You people know like all of my secrets. <laughs> uh, we put in a proposal to do exactly that. Uh, it didn't get funded. Um, but we've been thinking a lot about that in terms of how to mimic those processes in a way that would actually be, mimic them in the lab in a way that would actually tell us something about the atmosphere. Um, but that's, yes, we have been thinking about that for sure. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think I may have mentioned this to you before, but, you know, we do know that 10% of main sequence stars have thousand times as much dust as right. the solar system. And yeah. so, you know, I've long been very interested in the question of what predictions would you make for exoplanet atmospheres that live in the very dusty systems versus the not very dusty systems? And there's actually, I think, a little bit of data on yeah. this question now, although not very much. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point I would say my, my guess would be that systems that are dustier, will, the planets will be hazier. I think I feel comfortable saying that in public now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have any papers to cite um, for that for that statement, but I think based on some stuff that we've been doing, I think that that is um, probably a true statement. It would depend in part on the composition of the dust, um, but I think for the most part, as like you know, kind of an average, um, if there is a higher dust flux into the top of the atmosphere, it's, that planet is more likely to be hazy for a given composition. So you showed that uh, the haze production rate goes down with oxygen. With molecular oxygen, molecular yeah. Oxygen. So would you go far to say that planets with large surface water reservoirs have clear atmospheres in general? Ooh. <laughs> I don't think I would go that far. Um, I mean, the thing that planets with large surface, oh, this might be a dangerous statement. I have to think about this. It's hard to think on your feet about weird other planets. Um, I think that, so the most efficient removal mechanism for particles in an atmosphere is rain. Um, and so the easiest way to have a clear atmosphere is to live on a planet where it rains. Um, so in that sense, I think having a large surface water reservoir, um, if it implies that there is a cycle between the surface and the atmosphere, um, probably those planets would be less likely to be hazy, but it might be because it rains. Not Titan? <laughs> yes. Okay, two things. Um, one, it rains very rarely on Titan. Um, so although it does rain, um, it rains pretty rarely. 
Uh, two, one of my former grad students um, is hopefully sending me a draft of a paper soon um, that demonstrates that the particles in Titan's atmosphere are actually really horrible um, cloud condensation nuclei. Um, and so they might actually not be the thing that is getting removed from the atmosphere when it rains. Um, and that's actually supported a little bit by what happened during um, the Huygens landing. So um, Huygens was on parachute from about 160 kilometers to the surface. And the pre-Cassini models predicted that they were going to get all of these beautiful images basically the whole time that it was on parachute. Uh, if you actually watch the Huygens descent videos that have been put together, which are amazing, you can't see the surface at all until um, about eight, seven or eight kilometers above the surface. And the reason that it had been predicted that you would be able to see the surface was because everybody assumed that because we knew it rained on Titan that the lower atmosphere would have been cleared out by the rain. Um, and that's clearly not what's happening there. Um, I think in part because we misunderstood how often it rains. Um, but also I think in part because it's now maybe turning out that those haze particles are actually really bad cloud condensation nuclei for the, for the methane and ethane in Titan's atmosphere. In terms of the effect on the um, production rate for the haze particles, yeah, um, I don't, I'm still trying to understand. So the one flaw that, I mean the one flaw, okay, there's a lot of flaws in the experiments that we do. One of the flaws in um, our experiments is, and there's ways to get around this, we just haven't done it yet. It's very challenging to decouple um, the optical depth effects from actually just having the gas present. Um, and so one of the things that I would like to do is to work on that more. Um, the other obvious solution to actually answering a lot of these questions about the effects of these gases is to do more modeling. Um, but the problem with doing modeling, I kind of alluded to before, um, we don't actually have a really good way to mod model haze formation. Um, it's all parameterized because we don't actually understand the processes. Um, it reminds me of forming the solar system. Like we can build things to a certain size and then once they get big enough, like physics takes over and we can you know, make bigger things. But there's this spot in the middle where we don't know how to get from like a six carbon molecule to a small particle. Um, and so we can't use models to do this stuff very much. And so it's one of the reasons why we do experiments. But I still, and we're the, um, at this point, we're the only ones that have done any experiments with molecular oxygen. Um, and so I don't actually really understand a lot of what's going on. Um, and we need to do a lot more work before we can figure that out. I think it's really important um, because people think about oxygen so much as um, a biosignature, um, but one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I'm, I'm not the only one because there's actually, I think, a paper with this title that came out relatively recently, um, but I think it's worth spending a lot of time actually figuring out um, for certain types of planets whether haze, um, the presence or absence of haze would be a biosignature, um, and that's related to, to a lot of these um, questions. completely out of left field, and I have no idea if you've ever thought about this, but there's a strange observation on the Earth that the xenon isotopic composition of the atmosphere has changed through time. And one hypothesis of how this happens is um, interaction of heavy xenon ions with organic haze. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, is this something you've ever encountered, and do you have any thoughts or ideas about it? So I feel like... Um as far as I understand it, like magnetic fields get blamed on a lot of things in certain areas of astronomy, and, and dust gets blamed on a lot of things. And I think in planetary atmospheres, haze is like the culprit when we don't understand things. Um, but it's actually not only Earth um, where this has come up, uh, because there's some, some oddities in Titan's isotope, um, in Titan's noble gases, um, and in some of the isotopes um, that have been blamed on them interacting with haze in a specific way. Um, I don't think we actually believe the work that was done for Titan. I've never looked at um, any of the conversations um, to do with Earth. Um, I can't think of a reason off the top of my head why that would happen, but that doesn't mean that it wouldn't. Uh, but people have certainly thought about it for places other than Earth. The people hypothesizing it are mantle geochemists, not necessarily <laughs> atmospheric chemists, so. I mean. All right. Are there any other? If there are no other questions, let's uh, 
Thank uh, Sarah again for a very stimulating talk.